All right, so this is the uh, Unicorn Team 360 technology, and I will let them go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this talk. It's our honor to share our research with you. In this presentation, we are going to talk about one vulnerability we found in NXP SOCs, and we will show you how to use this vulnerability to implant malware into the peripherals, which are made of these chips. Now let me firstly give a brief self-introduction. My name is Yi Wei. I'm a security researcher of Unicorn team. And this is Shao Kun Cao. He found this vulnerability. And that is my colleague, Hao Jishan. Unicorn team is a research group within 360 technology. The team was formed in 2014. We focus on the security issues in numerous types of wireless systems. During this talk, firstly, we will introduce why we did this research. Then, we will discuss the secure boot and its different types of implementations. Thirdly, we will reveal the detail of a vulnerability. We provide two exploits. One is to bypass the Unicode ID verification in Secure Boot. Another is to implant malware in a peripheral. Finally, we will give our recommendations to vendors who use these chips. Secure Boot is widely used in personal computer, workstation, server, and smartphone. It's used to prevent malicious code from being loaded and executed. But in the embedded system, because its resource is limited, there is no TPM or trust zone within these systems. So how to implement Secure Boot? We want to research the implementation of Secure Boot in close constrained systems and try to find a common way to implant malware into such systems. Let's have a basic understanding of Secure Boot. As this figure shows, in the, in the system which have secure boot support, there is a primary bootloader and I want and I want time program memory in the main chip. In the main chip. The primary bootloader is designed by the chip vendor and permanently bind into its boot room at the chip manufacturing stage. The one-time program about memory is used to store the root public key. It was banned at the product manufacturing stage. In the external storage, there are secondary bootloader or kernel drivers, applications, corresponding public keys and uh, signatures, etc. When the system is power up, the primary bootloader will verify the secondary bootloader. If the secondary bootloader is valid, it will be ex executed. Then the secondary bootloader will verify the kernel, and so on. Otherwise, the system will be hard. This mechanism ensure all the binary code executed in this system is trusted. 
we also can see the primary bootloader and the root public key is the root of the whole trust chain. The master cannot be replaced or bypassed. So what can secure the boot be used for? Secure boot can be used to prevent the malicious code from being executed. Here we give two attack example. One example is a talk of Black Hat Conference US 14. In this talk, the author provided a way to inject malicious features into a 4G modem dongle and attack its users. Another example is a research provided by our team in DEFCON 23. We modified the firmware of a remote cell to eavesdrop nearby cellular users. If these products have secure boot, such attacks are hard to perform again. Secure boot also can be used to protect the copyright of product vendors. In industrial and commercial area, different types of secure boot have been implemented and used. One example is UEFI in personal computer and server with the support of TPM. Just the trusted operating system is allowed to load and boot. Another example is the smartphone with the support of trust zone. Only the trusted OS can boot and the trusted application can be installed and executed. Both the two implementations require hardware support. The specific hardware unit ensures the boot ROM and the public key cannot be replaced. But in the embedded system or IoT system, due to the limits of cost, there is no hardware unit like Trust Zone. How to implement the core boot? Many chip vendors design a lot of SOCs for such cost-sensitive usages. These SOCs integrate a lot of components such as flash, RAM, timer, radio circuit, and so on, which meets most of the aimed application scenarios. It only requires very few external components to design a product with this type of chip. So it's widely accepted because it's easy to use and low cost. Chief vendors also design a mechanism which can be used to protect the firmware from being read out. This mechanism is called as code read protection. If the code read protection function is enabled, the attack or in system program interface of these chips will be disabled. Nobody can read out or erase the flash through this interface again. But this also results the firmware cannot be updated anymore. So as the app figure shows, the product vendor also designed the customized bootloader and implemented them in the application programming features in this bootloader. With the IP support, the application array can be updated again. As the lower figure shows, if the bootloader array is not allowed to is not allowed to update, the public key can be stored in the bootloader array. This is also fully satisfied the requirements of secure boot. 
That is, the bootloader and the public key cannot be replaced. To understand how such a secure boot can protect the designer's copyright, we have to understand how does the copier kill a hardware product. As this figure shows, firstly, the copier buys the pieces of target product. Then he recovers the PCB layout and the corresponding components through reverse engineering. Thirdly, he corrects the code protecting mechanism to read out the firmware. After that, he, buy, he buys the same components and reproduces the PCBA. Finally, he buys the firmware into the PCBA and he can batch kill on target products. Now let's calculate the cost the copier needs to pay in this procedure. The main cost occurs in the PCB reverse and the firmware readout steps. According to the complexity of the PCB board, the cost of PCB reverse is from $20 to $200. In the firmware readout step, depending on the strength of the of code read protection, the cost is from $200 to $5,000. The total cost of copy product is much lower than design one. This brings great damage to business firms. So to defend the copier, the chief vendor also designed a so-called unique ID feature. They gave a unique serial number to each of their chips. The unique ID is factory laser into the silicon at the chip manufacturing stage and cannot be modified again. As the left figure shows, the product maker can read out the chip ID and combine it with the application to generate its signature. When the system boots, the bootloader reads the unique ID and verifies the signature. If the signature is valid, the application firmware will be executed and the normal function of the product can be used. Otherwise, the product became the brick. So even the copiers buy the same chips and buy the same firmware due to the unique ID, they will get a break. When the secure boot is bound to the unique ID, besides the costs we calculated before, the copier also needs to patch all corresponding passes to bypass the unique ID and the signature verification in the firmware. Because the embedded firmware is strongly partition dependent linked, the cost to reverse and the patch the firmware is very high. According to the complexity of the firmware, the cost is from $5,000 to $50,000. And the copier needs to pay again when the firmware is updated. This is not a valuable deal, so the unique ID is a good weapon to defend the copier. Now let's have an analysis of the strength of such types of secure boot. How to bypass the secure boot verification? As we mentioned before, patch is not a good way. In hardware or 
in high-level operating system, such as Windows or Linux, we can hook the system API to change the behavior of the application, but not to patch the application itself. For example, we can hook the MAC address read API to give arbitrary MAC address to deceive the application. But in the resource constrained SLCs, is the hook mechanism also effective and how to implement it? Now let's show Quan and Hauji to reveal the details of the exploits. Okay, the NXP Cortex M series uses the method to access the UID. There is a function pointer in the fixed position of the ROM. After accessing the function pointer, you can invoke a ROM function. The UID of the chip can be obtained by calling this function. This subroutine is multifunctional and different functions can be selected through other parameters. <clears throat> this is the code that access the UID. And this function has two parameters. One is the entry parameter. And the first one, the integral of the entry parameter, is the command. When the command is 58, which is to read the UID value, and the UID value will be found in the return parameter. This is the description of the UID function in the NXP's document. It's very simple. We just have to forge the same function. That's what we will hook to. As we know, debug systems can change the action of a program. We can set a debug breakpoint, halt a running program, or change the value of a variable or a register. In Cortex-M, we can do this without changing the fresh ROM. It means that if we can write a patch and run it before the bootloader, we can simulate a light debugger. It will work similar to a JTAG debugger. The FPB register is one of the registers of the debugging system. Of course, it can be accessed by the JTAG, but it can also be accessed by the code. If we write code like JTAG do, actually, we are implementing a light version of soft debugger. The FPB is used to provide fresh patch and breakpoints. Flash patch means that if an instruction accessed by the CPU matches a certain address, the address can be remapped to a different location so that a different value is obtained. Alternatively, the matched address can be used to trigger a breakpoint event. Then the flash patch feature is very useful for testing, such as adding a diagnosis program code to a device that cannot be used in normal situations unless the FPB is used to change the program control. The FPB unit can be programmed to generate breakpoint events even if the program memory cannot be altered. However, it is limited to six instruction addresses and two literal addresses. The FVB has two functions. One is hardware breakpoint. It can generate a breakpoint event to the processor to invoke debug modes such as halt or debug monitor. Patch 
instruction or literal data from code memory space to SRAM. And uh, it has six instruction parameters and uh, two literal comparators. Here is a very simple example to show how to use the FPV. The FPV, FPV remap register is set to 0x2000100. It means that once the comparator is matched, the code or the literal data will be replaced by the data in the mapped memory. In this example, we set two variables to replace. One is the instruction, another is a literal data. The FP compare zero indicates the instruction in the offset 0x8001000 will be replaced to another instruction. The FP compare six indicates that the data in the offset 0x8001000 is replaced. If we enable the FPV by set the FP control register to three, the action of the code will be totally changed. It should be the data in R4 is 0x8000000, but actually R4 is skipped and R1 is 0x10000, and the R4 should be zero, but negative one, in fact, The FPV has a fresh patch control register that contains an enable bit to enable the FPV. In addition, each comparator comes with a separate enable bit in its comparator control register. Both of the enable bit must be set to one for a comparator to operate. The comparators can be programmed to remap addresses from code space to the SRAM memory region. When this function is used, the remap register needs to be programmed to provide the base address of the remap contents. The upper three bits of remap register is hardwired to 001, which is limited the remap base address location to be within 0x2000000 to 3FFFFF80, which is always visiting the SRAM memory region. And this is an example to replace the literal data. This constant int data is initial to negative one. After compiling and linking, it will be stored into the flash. It cannot be changed again at runtime. We program the FPV to set the constant to remap this data to SRAM and try to set its value to zero. After we enable the FPV, all codes that access this constant will get zero. In order to verify this vulnerability in real world product, we use the JLink to implement to exploit. Before discussing the detail of this exploit, let me introduce the JLink. JLink is a powerful emulator and debug tools for ARM processors. It's very useful for ARM developers to debug their firmware and hardware. This tool is designed by Seger. They implement Secure Boot in their firmware and use the unique ID provided by NXP to verify the license. It has a USB port, and under a normal use scenarios, it must be plugged into computer. So it's also a good carrier for hardware children. 
Based on the example and the character of NSP's SOC, we can use the FPV to change the entry of ROM API function. There are function pointers in a fixed position. Therefore, find out the function pointer which you want to hook and remap it to the fake function. That's part of the code. This invokes the FPB func to remap and go to the entry point of original program. Just right before the target. And this is the fake IAP, which is the original IAP is directed to. In this example, we replace the command number 58, which is to access the UID. In other cases, it will jump to the original owned entry, so that it only modifies the UID, but will not change any other function. You should remap the original function to the fake one. Now let me show you the demonstration. In this video, you can see after we burn the jlink firmware and our exploit code, the development bird has the same function as jlink. Okay, let my partner, Mr. Hao Qi, finish this topic. So, thanks for my colleague's explanation about the details of the attack. So, in the following sentence, I will introduce you guys how to uh, really exploit or illegal copy a real product of the XP production. So, in this video, we will show you how to uh, copy a uh, jet ink production one step by step. Uh, but before that, I will really apologize for the bad solutions of the video uh, because we kind of like make, made a mistake. So in this video, um, uh, can we make this? Oh, it doesn't matter. So, okay. so I just click it. Uh, so before we start this video, I want to, as we as we mentioned in the previous discussion, we needed a firmware of the uh, Jetink to do our patch stuff because we didn't actually modify the firmware. We actually patched some kind of code sections, uh, some kind of data sections inside of the firmware and uh, do our stuff, such like uh, to bypass the anti-clone stuff, uh, anti-clone mechanisms, and uh, so. In this video, we kind of like, uh, so before that, we needed the firmware of this jet ink production. Uh, but as we discussed before, the jet ink production has kind of like a, a code read protections. With this uh, protections, you can't read the firmware outside. You can't extract the firmware. And uh, because there, uh, I mean, if this code read protection is enabled, then you can't access this production with the jet ink or, or nor with the ISP uh, programming system. I mean, you can actually erase the uh, data, you can actually erase the uh, code, but you can't read them out. So, but there is a very simple way you can get the firmware. And they basically store this firmware in, in the desktop applications. Remember, jet ink has some software on, on your PC, on your Mac, so, so you can just upgrade your, uh, upgrade the firmware of the JEDIC hardware. So basically they just store this firmware in plain text, so you can just extra it, or you can just copy them out. Um, with the extra firmware, so we can do the uh, integral copy. So let's start. So in the uh, right bottom corner, so you can see we actually have a computer, we actually have a jet ink, we have a development board. Uh, on the development board, uh, evaluation board, so you can just see there is a exactly same chip, you know, we were using on the, uh, I'm sorry, my bad. 
yeah, we were using the exact same chip, uh, same microprocessors on the evaluation board, and uh, this is exact same with the jet ink pr uh, hardware production. So with the hardware, we can just uh, we can just download this hardware into the evaluation board, and uh, my colleague is just doing this stuff. So you can see, oh, because the error here is means we actually forgot to power it up. And uh, right now, this is the firmware downloading. You can see. So with the firmware and with the same chip, basically, if there is no license verification, there is if there is no uh, uh, signature, basically they are just the same products, right? Same hardware, same software. But the truth is. Oh, so right here, if you flash it, you can see there is uh, two jet inks in the, uh, in the hardware list. Now we launch the jet ink software command line to verify if all of them are working or not. So this is the first one. This is a legal copy. And, uh, and right now we are trying to confirm the second one. This is the illegal copy, which is also the evaluation board. See, it's totally different because the verification procedure is not passed. I mean, it's failed. So after this, we are trying to deploy our uh, our patch by uh, leveraging the FBB unit. So before that, uh, remember we just talked about there is a code protection mechanism inside of the firmware. So if we just uh, burn this firmware and uh, we run it, then the evaluation board is dead because you can't actually, uh, you can't actually erase it, you can't actually uh, program it by the JTAG, right? But there's also another way, just use the ISB programming uh, mechanism to erase all these uh, code sections. I'm sorry, oh, this, this is really my bad. So right now, my colleagues is trying to erase the evaluation board and make it as, make it as brand new, and so we can do the patch stuff after that. And there is a tool called Flash Magic. You can do things like this. Okay, then this evaluation board is blank, so we can do the next step. Connect it. So this is uh, this is actually the code we clone the unique ID and uh, and uh, we do the hook functions. So basically, while compilation, so we can just uh, use the original firmware as a section of our new firmware. So we can just put our uh, bypass code and the patch code inside of the another blank, another region of the flash, and the, and uh, uh, combine all of this together as a new firmware and and download it into the hardware. And uh, trying to flash it and verify, and now we launch a new jet ink terminal to verify if our uh, work is doable or not. So this is the original one, this is a legal copy, And the second one is the evaluation board. So you, right now you can see there is totally the same. And uh, the serial number, if, if our solution is better, I mean, uh, if our video solution is better, then you can see the uh, unique ID or the serial number is exactly the same. And you can just use as uh, uh, exactly the same the production. So we 
or basically we call it illegal copy. But, uh, but I mean, we just do this for funds, not for profit. So we were trying to say, oh, is there any way we can just uh, exploit this, you know, do something more interesting? So then we were thinking about how about the hardware charging? I mean, imagine this scenario. There, if there is, um, so like the US is trying to attack the era, right? There is a, there was a case that uh, CIO, FBI, I can't remember, but uh, they kind of like they intercept uh, uh, a, 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 a bunch of printers which was setting, which was intended setting to the Iraq, right? So they implement a bunch of, uh, they just intercepted it, they patched the firmware, and uh, those kind of printers just was their boat, their boat net, and, they, and those kind of printers just steal a lot of stuff for them. So we were thinking about can we do that? I mean, patch the firmware, patch the firmware of the embedded system is not quite easy. It's not like the uh, a computer, you can do this easily. You have a lot of whole platform to do this. But uh, with the IPv function, we can do this very easily. I mean, the IPv function, it just, uh, it's very simple. You can just hook a, a function, or you can just hook a, a, a snip of code to, to do other, uh, some other stuff. It won't, uh, it won't infect the integrity of this firmware, and you don't have to actually analy analysis the uh, firmware, and uh, so you can just put your code and uh, co and evoke this function, that is all. So we were thinking about how to inject the hardware charging inside of the Jlink production. And uh, the Jlink is using the NXP chip, right? So, uh, which is also based on the Cortex M4 core, and, uh, and it's, it has a giant flash, it's very, very I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty enough for us. So, uh, the Jlink firmware is also used a lower part of the flash, so we can just, uh, there's enough place for us, so we can just place this hardware charging inside of the uh, blank region. So, if we, if we want, we can just, uh, uh, we can just in inject the hardware charging inside of the firmware before we, before some other, some other people purchased this, uh, uh, this hardware. So, how about, Add a bad USB into a Jlink, right? You purchase a Jlink. You saw it's it's huge, expensive, and then you saw uh, and then, and then you said you can it can accelerate your development procedure. But it turns out it's a bad it's a bad USB. It can just steal all of this stuff from your computer because it because you just because you just uh, connect this hardware into your computer and uh, into your laptop, and then you think, okay, this is safe enough. I can do my stuff. Mm. So. Uh, in the, uh, so, I mean, if you were trying to bypass the anti-clone mechanism, we were talking about the, uh, unique ID verification function. But in this one, we can just hook another, uh, we can just hook another, uh, uh another system, uh, system, uh, function call. So in this case, we were, we were, uh, in, we were, uh, we were hooking the SysTick handler. So this is basically, uh, inter, uh, exception handler. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of function inside of the hardware, inside of the system, and need it. It's kind of like a time, time slice. So this one will just help you to count the time, right? So this is, a, this is, an, uh, I mean, all of these computers, all of this embedded system, we just use, uh, we just use a function like this. So we, so this is our main target. And, uh, after we do that, I mean, the normal function, we just keep it original. It's also, I mean, we didn't, uh, we didn't harm the integrity of this firmware. So, uh, how to charge, how to trigger this charge? I mean, uh, you can, it can be just considered that we have two parts of the firmware. The first part of the firmware is the original part of the uh, jet ink. It can do the uh, debug probe. It can do all of these things. This is what you do for the 800 bucks. But uh, if we, and another part is the bad USB. This part of the function, it will be executed in some times, and uh, it will just uh, uh, inject a bunch of code t into your computer, and uh, act like the USB, uh, USB, uh, like, like a USB uh, device, like, like uh, your keyboard, like your mouse, it can do everything, right? This is basically is a human. So, uh, we have two parts of the firmware, and uh, we hook the time interrupt entry. So we do this by the hooking the function firmware that inter uh, that which 
is the uh, which is the cystic handler. It's the, it's a previous slice. So the 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 rest thing is uh, I mean the rest thing we need to do is like uh, the first step is we try to compile this bad USB code. The second step is we try to hook this critical function. And uh, once this critical function is executed, okay, then we can just uh, execute our firmware. I mean, it's a bad USB stuff. And also, the JLEC will just act as pretty normal. You can just use this to download, to debug, uh, everything else. I mean, it doesn't matter. But uh, suddenly, it gets to become a bad person. I'm sorry. So, this is the details of our attack implementation. And uh, so you can see, so you can see the first step is of course the power up, right? Uh, of course, this is after we uh, download our firmware into this hardware. So the first thing, is, I mean, it's, a, it's just a power up, and uh, we also we we don't want to make our code wrong, execute it, uh, you know, in the beginning of this power ups procedure. I mean, we want to be executed. We want it to be executed in the some certain time, so nobody will just be noticed. So we put an attack flag inside. I mean, remember the sysTick. So this is basically some like the time counter. So we set up a we set up a time counter, and uh, we tell them, okay, when this uh, if this uh, jetting is powered like five minutes, then our from uh, then our charging will be executed. This sounds like more reliable when when we just put a jump inside of the, I mean, in the beginning of the firmware and uh, to do all this better stuff, I mean, it's too obvious. Somebody will just notice, the, okay, I just plug in this and uh, my, computer is, my computer is doomed. Nobody won't like that. So that's why we choose this critical fun system, uh, system function as our hook function and uh, we choose a uh, time uh, counter as our uh, attack method. So, so in this video, we can show you, uh, this is the demo of a bad USB. And uh, so this is the code, this is, a, uh, this is the original code of the bad USB. And uh, you can see right now we are trying to compile all of this into a firmware and we download it into the uh, JDink, official JDink stuff. So, right, download. And we left our computer right over there. And uh, leave it wrong. So you can see now there is no man touching the touching our computer. And you just open a DEF CON website. So imagine that it can just open everything. It can just uh, steal stuff like uh, like a personal account or download the firmware into your into your computer and execute it. And you will just you can't be noticed. So, actually, uh, as we mentioned before, this is uh, not actually uh, an XP chip. This is an uh, AMP chip's fault. I mean, this is because we have a debug function inside of our protection. So this is basically as uh, this is basically accelerate some hackers try to attack uh, try to attack your production. This is just help them to lower the lower the difficult. So all basket of this Cortex M3, Cortex M4 of XP chip, serious chip, they have the same FPP function, uh, I'm sorry, same FPP unit, so you can just uh, uh, leveraging or you can say, or you can say you just exploit this into a uh, malicious function. So, uh, but also there's uh, some other vendors also have the chip that provide a UID feature, so you can also clone their product, or you can also implement uh, hardware charging inside of their production, you can, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I, it, in an old fashioned way, we, if we want to implement hardware charging, we need to analyze uh, the hardware, we need to analyze the firmware, and we try to implement all of this inside, but uh, with this, we can just uh, use FPB to hook a function to patch some stuff. This will be much easier. And, uh, uh, somebody was, I just want to say, is there any mitigation measure? And of course, just the first step is never leak your firmware. If you don't have a, if, some, if nobody can get your firmware, of course they can't 
they, they, they can't do this. I mean, what's the point, right? You have, uh, you don't have the firmware and you give them a bunch of hardware and tell them, uh, you can, okay, you can do this. Nobody will, will use that. So, uh, also, the second one is what we in suggest for the XP chip. So, uh, basically, I'm sorry, for the Jetlink, uh, enterprise. So basically, they will just uh, disable the FPV function before they call the critical uh, API. So, I mean, it's it's not a uh, sufficient. It's actually not a sufficient kind of measure, but it's but it's much harder for the hackers trying to do stuff like what we done before. Also, we also you can just uh, pass the uh, firmware to. You know, there's a blank, there's a bunch of blank flash regions uh, in, of the firmware. So you can just pad this firmware to set all this blank uh, flash area to a specific value. So for example, you can just uh, uh, use instruction like the BL reset handler. That means if the, uh, if the code, uh, if the blank flash region was, uh, was being excluded, then you just directly jump back into the, uh, back into the beginning. So it's, not usable anymore. So also, you should always verify the signature of the entire flash instead of just a, just a piece of code. It's, it's totally not secure, right? It's, it's a, I mean, it's just leave a giant blank hole and, to, and let us uh, set and told us, okay, you can take it. It's, uh, I mean, so we also received the advice from the P3 of the XP. That, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's also a security group of the XP. So, they will suggest uh, the, uh, the enterprise who, all the companies who were willing to use their XP chip that is, uh, enables the code rate protection. I mean, the code rate protection setting has, uh, it's, uh, three levels. Uh, there is, uh, uh, level one, level two, and level three. I mean, level one and level two, there's only, they, it just disables the jet hack. You can also use the leverage the ISP to do the better stuff like what we have done before. But, uh, if you enable the level three, yes, you can't use Jetpack. You can't use ISP. I mean, you can't. This chip is and it's not reprogrammable. But uh, but that also means if your production has something wrong and it ships tens of thousands of stuff like to the uh, uh, to the users to the endpoint, and if something wrong, then you are doomed. All of this will be refunded, and uh, your company will broke. So the kind of errors is like it's not a good idea to put the in critical to, to put a critical API into the address region that can be remapped. I mean, uh, it's just a, the name is called like a flash patch and breakpoint. That all, that also means it can only, I mean, the only flat the, uh, the, the only the flash region can be remapped. So nothing else. So you can just put this in some critical register or some higher uh, address. That that'll be that be much better. So we can recommend that SOC vendors just prohibit reading, remapping all of this ROM API in uh, subsequent product. I mean, if you just ship it, if you ship it before it can be recalled, right? So it's much harder. So this is a reference of our product. Uh, I mean, our work. So you can see. The principle is much, it's pretty easy, but uh, you can do a lot of better stuff to do this. So, thanks, and uh, thanks, thanks guys. So, if you have any questions, you can just ask me right now.